Okay, so our first speaker is uh, Vladimir Ivanov, and he will talk about a paper uh, entitled uh, Exponential Expressivity in Deep Neural Networks Through Transient Chaos. All right, go ahead, Vladimir. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, so briefly uh, in this paper, there's four parts to it, really. Uh, first, they derive a mean field theory uh, of how the signal uh, input signal propagates through the layers. Uh, and then using that theory, they look at for a phase transition, uh, you know, with it in the layers as it propagates, uh, finding that there's an order to chaos transition. And focusing then on the chaotic regime, they look at how a simple manifold propagates, the geometry of a simple manifold propagates uh, as, a, as a result of these chaotic yeah. dynamics, uh, leading to uh, what they call exponential expressivity. Uh, and finally, they showed that uh, shallow networks can't really achieve this uh, exponential expressivity that uh, deep networks possess. So starting with the first part, <clears throat> uh, they formulate the problem uh, in the context of multi-layer feed-forward networks, uh, where dynamics for a given input x0, so x0 is just your input vector, uh, are dictated by probably the well familiar equations where we have the x uh, multiplied by the weights and added with biases. And the, that gives us our h uh, l vector, where l is just the layer. So this is for an arbitrary layer, uh, layer l. And then that bet gets passed through the activation function, nonlinear activation function, uh, which in this case for experiments, they used tanch but they say that this should generalize, this analysis should generalize to um, other nonlinear activation functions. Okay, and that gives us our uh, X representation of the input uh, X zero for a given layer L. <clears throat> so the key point here is that they don't train these networks, they just randomly initialize the weights and biases uh, as Gaussian distributed uh, uh, values. So, and then for the weights, they normalize this variance uh, by the number of neurons in that layer so that there's no uh, aggregation uh, or subtraction of uh, activity as you go from layer to layer. <clears throat> okay, so then in the mean field theoretic approach, they consider so, ensembles so, uh, of these what, what do you networks. Mean, yeah. can I ask a question? So, so this uh, uh, over n to the nl minus one. This is to keep the variance of the incoming sigma of order one. That's the point here. Uh, yeah. So you don't want the layer to add additional uh, uh, variance, right? So you don't. You, yeah. you want like variance of the input signal to be of order one, so that ten uh, h is actually doing something other than outputting plus or minus one. Uh, yeah, I think that's correct. So they okay. they want the signal to stay constant. The, Average, right? Yeah, I, mean, average. I, think, I think they want the variance to stay constant. Uh, the variance of the incoming signal to be of the same order as you go from layer to layer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So in the mean field theoretic approach, uh, they consider ensembles of these random networks, uh, which they consider have minimal constraints on structure besides the feed forward aspect of it. Um, Okay, so then to look at how X0, the input changes from layer to layer. Uh, at each layer, they consider the, uh, the length of the, um, the H uh, vector or the, the layer representation. Um, so that's just the dot product uh, normalized by a number of neurons in that specific layer. Uh, and then they consider the limit with very large layers so, and the reason for that is that in that limit, uh, it's easier to work with because each HI, each neuron is basically consisted of a weighted sum of a large number of you know, neurons below it, uh, which ultimately is just a lot of neurons uh, that are uncorrelated random Gaussian variables uh, that have a zero mean. And that stems from the way they have initialized these networks. Uh, with the uh, Gaussian weights um, and biases. <clears throat> okay, so then the length uh, QL, as we've just defined, uh, becomes the variance of this distribution of inputs HI 
uh, which is Gaussian, again, in the limit of large layers. So this is important assumption um, and setup because this allows them to derive the iterative map uh, of this QL value from uh, the previous layer to the next layer. Uh, and just briefly, the whole Gaussian aspect of this is that you know this is defined as the integral over this Gaussian distribution that I just mentioned, where Z is the Gaussian variable. And then by integrating over it, uh, that represents kind of the average over all the input neurons um, for, for that layer L. So where I'll be focusing primarily is just the iterative map. Um, so basically the iterative map just takes the previous layers QL uh, and maps it to the current uh, layers QL as a function of the network parameters, uh, which in this case is just the variance of the weights matrix and the variance of the biases. Okay, so, so, so I guess to, for this Gaussian, the assumption is important uh, that D is much smaller than N sub L. So the depth is much smaller than the width. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it won't work. You wouldn't have uh, the separate outgoing signals from separate neurons would be correlated. Yeah, I think that that's that's correct. Okay. Yeah, because I think the maximum length they consider is like 20. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so their first result is the uh, the iterative map. So here they have both analytical results confirmed by numerical results. So the, the line is the theoretical or analytical result uh, for three different network configurations. So they kept uh, the bias variance fixed at 0 0.3 mm -hmm. and then kind of increase the variance of the weight matrix uh, from 1.3 to 4. And so you can see that the iterative map uh, changes as a result of these uh, three network configurations. So, I mean, the way to read this iterative map is you have the previous layers uh, length, say five, and then that gets mapped to like 11 or 12 for the current uh, layers length. Um, and so then you feed that back into here. And now, you know, at 12, you're much closer to this fixed point. So, and the fixed points lie on the unity line, which is basically where QL doesn't change from layer to layer uh, because it just maps onto itself. So it'll just mm -hmm. continue its loop. And you can see that- and it's a stable here. fixed point, right? So there are no, it's a stable fixed point. <clears throat> right, yeah, it's a stable fixed point here. Um, and so you can see this uh, stabilization towards mm -hmm. the fixed point for different inputs um, for the three network configurations and for three different initial uh, inputs. Uh, the stabilization is confirmed where mm -hmm. after like four layers, the, uh, the lengths converge to these respective um, fixed points. <clears throat> Why do they call it mean field theory? Where, where is the fields or, or what's? Uh... I think they just, they consider like a large number of ensemble networks uh, that's described by a, the Gaussian distribution. So I think that's basically the extent of that. Right, okay. There isn't really a field, just a collection of random Gaussian variables. Uh, that yeah, I, yeah, I was confused there. by that too. <laughs> and there are like no correlations between, like field theory. Yes, we have random variables, but then there are nearby correlations. There is a sense of which in which it's a field. Uh, here they don't have that, but that's that's fine. Yeah, that they don't formalize that here. Um, okay, so then they extend this analysis to, you know, a, a range of uh, network parameters. So you have the variance, uh, the biases, and the weights. Uh, and here you can see the three networks that they kind of showed here. Um, so the key point here is that by changing the variance of the weights and the biases, uh, you can have non-zero fixed points um, to which uh, regardless of your uh, input, the mm -hmm. network after a uh, very few layers, like four or five, will converge to that fixed point. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, so then they uh, looked for a transition, phase transition from order to chaos, uh, and they kind of applied the same formulation as is done in dynamical systems theory, where 
you you have a system and you start it at two slightly different uh, initial states. So you have a distance between those two initial states. And then you kind of track how the system changes uh, over time, those two states, uh, and you measure the, the evolving distance between those two states. So if the distance exponentially diverges or increases, then you're, uh, by definition, in the chaotic phase, the system is chaotic. And if it converges, then uh, you're in the ordered state. So they kind of apply the same principle here where they have two inputs, x0 and, uh, or x1 and x2. And now instead of just measuring the, um, the length by taking the dot product with the vector itself, they actually have uh, the dot product between the two uh, vectors. So, <clears throat> and again, normalized by the uh, size of the layer. So for Q11 and Q22, this is the same as Q1 that we had before because it's the dot product with itself. Uh, but for Q12 or Q21, that's then the, uh, uh, for the two inputs dot product. And so that allows them to define a correlation map, uh, which I'll be basically focusing on this. Um, that's defined again by now a joint distribution of Gaussian variables, um, which I won't get into because, yeah. Uh, so anyways. Um, I think I'm missing something important. So this x01 and x02 are just two different initial states, right? Uh, that, yeah. that we start with. And so like for a fixed point, the claim would be that they both have to go to the same state, right? Uh, and then if, 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 it's, if it's a stable fixed point, and if it's not stable, if there is a chaos, then they would have to diverge from one another, right? So that's kind of the, um, the, the idea here that they're trying. To... Yeah, yeah, that's that's the idea. So so the, they'll be measuring the correlation, um, the correlation between these two inputs and tracking that. I mean, I, I guess my question was why not just directly calculate the you know Lapunov exponent and see you know, but by you know the map tells you exactly how they. Um, especially if you linearize around the fixed point, the map itself will tell you whether the nearby points will converge or diverge. Uh, rather than having two, two uh, you know, test points, um, uh, have they done like perturbation theory around fixed points, or, or that that's not how they analyzed? I mean, I like the logic they, mm -hmm. So I mean, they do linearize uh, further on by computing the. They say the derivative at C1, which is the fixed point. Mm -hmm. So you have your, um, basically you have your iterative correlation map. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they assume that the network is at the fixed uh, fixed uh, length Q star that I showed before. Um, and so then this, and so then your cor iterative correlation map is just a function of the previous co layers correlation between the two inputs and the current correlation between the two inputs. I see. So yeah, okay. and then you have the trivial fixed point C star equals one. And so then stability of it is defined by the um, the slope at uh, mm -hmm. X1 or mm -hmm. or at, at C1 uh, defined as chi one. So the slope is chi one and uh, yeah, that dictates whether you're in chaotic or ordered phase. So if if chi one is less than one, then inputs get decorrelated as you get deeper and deeper into the network. Uh, and so the fixed point is not stable and diverges mm -hmm. from correlation value of one. Uh, and then the opposite happens when the slope is positive or chi one is greater than one and the inputs then correlate. So, so this is, they say this is the log of chi one is related to the Lyapunov exponent. Yeah, uh, so but they but, don't directly. But, but even if it deviates, even if you have your uh, unstable fixed point, doesn't mean that there is already chaos. You can have like bifurcations. Uh, then, then the system keeps jumping between two nearby states. So, like the, it, it's not a proof that the, this is a chaos. It's just a statement that the point it's just not a fixed uh, state point. But I think they equate the two, right? If it's not fixed, it's got to be a chaos. Yeah, I, I didn't read too closely the uh, supplementary part, but I don't think they okay. went That's further fine. than this. Yeah. So so I, I think they're trying to use the definition of the divergence mm -hmm. um, of two, uh, two states 
but I don't think they they don't derive. Yeah, that, that's usually a good assumption, right? So you know, if it diverges yeah. very often, it is a catalyst. Okay, so again, uh, just like last time, now we look at the correlation iterative map. Uh, and you can see for the cases where the slope is greater than one, the uh, <clears throat> the inputs decorrelate, which we can see uh, as a function of the layer L. So as you get progressively deeper into the network, the two inputs uh, correlation decreases, uh, in some cases to zero. And then if the slope is less than one, which is the blue network configuration, uh, then the correlation actually increases. And again, they tried several different initial uh, states. Okay, so yeah, that's the takeaway there. And then here they kind of show in terms of the um, the network state space, the what they call the critical line or phase transition line. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on. So now they look at how uh, chaotic networks uh, propagate uh, a simple one-dimensional manifold through the uh, layers of the network, and they consider just a circle uh, manifold <clears throat> defined as H1 parameterized by theta. So I think this probably is more descriptive of what happens. Okay, so in the ordered case, in the ordered network, um, you can see that the manifold with progressively with layer depth of layer uh, becomes kind of linearized and simpler mm -hmm. versus in the chaotic case, the manifold becomes more and more complex. So from layer five to layer 15. And this is also confirmed with the auto correlation functions uh, at you know, a given theta uh, point, which we can see the, that the, um, the chaotic networks with deeper layers have a narrower autocorrelation uh, window. So the perp the bright purple is the, I believe, layer 15 uh, or layer 20. Um, <clears throat> and then in the order case, you can actually see that the, uh, the bright purple becomes even wider. So, so the tendency is to, for the chaotic networks, as you get deeper and deeper with the layers, is to make this uh, manifold more and more complex and you know jumbled up as you can see here. <clears throat> okay, so so they wanted to more uh, more specifically quantitatively measure this uh, this uh, basically jumbling up or complexity of manifold, and to do this they use several uh, manifold curvature metrics. So one such metric is the extrinsic curvature kappa which uh, you can think of if this is your, uh, this line is your manifold, then if you take the tangent vector at a given point on this manifold uh, and the uh, normal vector, then in that space defined by these two vectors, you have a circle um, that is basically tangent to the manifold at that point. And so the, the degree of curvature in this manifold dictates how large the radius is. So they define kappa as one over the radius. So if the radius is very small, meaning that this manifold is uh, has high curvature, then the um, kappa gets larger. And then if the curvature is less, then kappa gets smaller. <clears throat> uh, and so the point here is to measure how fast the curvature changes as you traverse on this manifold which is quantified by changes in theta. Okay, so then the other metric they use is the Euclidean metric, which is just the dot product of the velocity vectors. Um, so basically this is just the tangent vectors. And then using these two, they combine into what's known as the Gauss metric, uh, which maps all these tangent vectors to like a unit sphere of tangent vectors. Uh, yeah, and then from that, by integrating over all thetas, you get global curvature. Okay, it's so curvature. it's like average curvature, right? Or yeah, sorry, average global. Curvature. Well, they call it global curvature, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then they track these uh, these three metrics 
uh, as a function of layers uh, and as a function of the different network configurations uh, that they had before. So, I mean, the colors change here, but basically the bright purple is the chaotic and so is the darker purple. So these two are chaotic networks, uh, configuration network configurations, and then the dark is the uh, ordered. So their uh, main result is that they say that for linear neurons or the ordered phase, what they find is that there's a trade-off between kappa and uh, GE, uh, the Euclidean metric, so that when one increases, the other decreases, and that means that the Gauss metric or sorry, the um, the global curvature basically stays fixed. Um, where, whereas when you have nonlinear neurons plus uh, a chaotic network configuration, uh, you don't have this trade-off. So uh, kappa stays fixed, but Euclidean metric increases, and therefore the global curvature also increases. And that 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 is their way to explain um, what was in the previous uh, plot with the increased complexity uh, as you get deeper and deeper with the layers. And the exponential part here comes from the fact that you can see that this is uh, in log scale. So this line is actually not straight. Um, <clears throat> so one thing I don't understand on the, for the first two, there is no integration over theta. So you're not really plotting uh, average values there, but some you take some fixed theta, and for that theta, you you make the yeah. Plot. So this is also normalized for uh, I believe number of neurons in each layer. But no, no, no. That, uh, theta is a parameter in of the input of the you know the circle, uh, which parameterizes the circle on at the input layer, right? So and you can look at the different thetas uh, and see how the curvature of those thetas change. Uh, 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 okay. Yes. Yeah, so you have different so, plots, right? And then, like, really, the only one that matters if you are making the point that something is unique uh, is once you integrate it. And so, looking at the integrated quantities would probably be more instructive for the first two cases, for the first two plots. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure about. Um, Especially that, when you yeah. look at this first uh, non-chaotic map, right? So it becomes the straight line, and then there's sharp corners. So the curvature in those sharp corners is huge, uh, and the curvature uh, on the on the on the lines is is, is small. And so, well, presumably, okay. Well, anyways, they haven't looked at integrated uh, average property of that for some reason. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not integrated because, like, these are actually uh, the iteration maps. They derive uh, iteration maps for these metrics as well, which I didn't show. Mm -hmm. And they're not exactly like just this. They're based on you know these metrics that I have here, but they're normalized and uh, uh, scaled by chi one, mm -hmm. um, as well as chi two, which they define as like the second uh, derivative. So, but yeah, I don't think there's any integration there. So, and the other thing I would have uh, would want to ask, like it should all be dependent to this Lapinov spectrum, right? That we discussed. So how <clears throat> Big the Lapunov exponents are, uh, or small, uh, and so probably this slopes that you show here could be extracted from just Lapunov spectrum of the map that goes from layer to layer. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why they didn't do directly Lapunov exponent because that that's kind of the the gold standard for measuring um, yeah, transition yeah. to gas. Right. Exactly. So that's fine. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so then I guess more intuitively to make more sense of this, uh, I, well, I, you can read it yourself if you want to, but like this is basically the description of what this means. Um, so by having uh, this exponential expressivity uh, in the deeper layers, the uh, this implies that the coordinate functions of the embedding HI can become highly complex curved basis functions on the input manifold coordinate data. And that allows deep network to compute exponentially complex functions over a simple low dimensional manifold. Um, okay, so the very last slide uh, that I have is them kind of confirming this numerically, showing that uh, if you look at deeper layer neurons, 
they can fit in the chaotic regime. They can fit better to the complex, you know, regression task, you know, so layer one versus layer 13. Um, and then they show this uh, uh, with this plot here where with depth, the angular error decreases. Um, and then shallow networks cannot reproduce this because no matter how wide your shallow depth, uh, your, your, your size of the layer in a shallow network becomes, you still have basically this massive uh, angular error. So uh, shallow network neurons cannot approximate the same or, or cannot get close to that same exponential expressivity as deep neurons. So, uh, so that I don't understand as well, because it's, it seems like they always want to go to the fixed point, meaning they want to be D, D to uh, the number of layers to be uh, large enough. Yes, smaller than the width in order to this fixed point analysis to be correct, but you still have to go uh, deep enough. So, so if you are talking about uh, a shallow network that you just may not get to the fixed point, maybe that's their point. You just never get to the fixed point. And so that's why... Uh, you don't get this highly curved manifolds. Maybe that's that's. that's yeah, I, I think I think that's that's the key takeaway okay. is that you, they can't because if you look um here. So before that, I had showed the fixed point. Um, here it takes only four layers to really reach this fixed point, but in terms of correlation, it takes much longer. Um, mm -hmm. So for correlation, it takes like twenty five layers. Um, to to get to like you know the fixed point of the correlation so for for the two inputs to be correlated or decorrelated uh, and so yeah I guess that's that's where the the deep uh, part of this comes in versus shallow mm -hmm. so any other questions yes good other questions comments. So the, maybe then I'll ask one more question. So yeah, it's it's true that it may take you longer to get to the to sh to get to the fixed point if if uh, you have many Lapinov exponents, some of them are kind of decaying very slowly. Uh, but but then it there would still be kind of a, I think a trade-off because the, the the wider network is the more Lapinov exponents are there, and then uh, and then it, it should take you longer actually to get to a fixed fixed point. But maybe what they are saying is that most of those Lapinov exponents, uh, all of them uh, decay exponentially, the, the dis distances and that direct, the respective direction decay exponentially. So maybe it doesn't matter. All of them die off uh, very fast. But um, but but I, I guess there's some kind of calculation that I would want to see because you do have more directions in which uh, you may not uh, have your Lapinov exponents being negative or um, uh, large enough, large negative enough. Yeah, I don't think I saw anything directly addressing that. Um, okay. I mean, I might have missed something, but yeah, I'm not sure. Right, other questions? Okay, thank you, Vladimir. Stop recording.